Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Profit Tool Belt Podcast. I'm very happy to have you here. Today, we've got an interesting interview with a gentleman named Sir Darren Jacklin. Now, some of you guys know I like to joke around, especially those of you who've been in coaching meetings with me, and I'll, I'll address you as Sir This or Lady That. But Darren is actually a knight. He has been knighted. And hopefully we get into that a little bit in today's episode, because that would be an interesting add-on to the story and definitely unique definitely unique. He is an extremely energetic and passionate gentleman. And I'm sure that will come through in today's interview. Um, one of the things he has a lot of experience in is how to attract and retain great people. Now, his experience is global, as you might expect. And what, the reason I have him as a guest is first, because of his energy and enthusiasm, I think he's going to make a great guest. But second, I want you to understand the perspective of somebody who does this globally who's building a global team. He actually has a charity as well that operates in Africa. I hope we get a chance to talk about that as well. But he has global operations. And I want you to understand just from the just the bare bones perspective, how what we encounter in our local market is the same as we encounter uh, uh, internationally. So these are problems that everybody's dealt with in the past. You don't have to feel like you're alone. We are all here facing the same challenges every single day. Sometimes in our work, we think we're the only one getting in the truck, getting in the car, driving to our shop, driving to the job site, driving to the office, and nobody else has the same experience as us. I'm sorry, my friend, you are wrong. You're wrong. And there are people out there who have valuable experiences to share. So I'm glad you're here on the show. Let's get to hear what Sir Darren, J Sir Darren Jacqueline has to say today about recruiting people and retaining great people in the organization. Let's get to it. Sir Darren Jacqueline, how are you? I'm grateful to be here, Don. I'm happy to have you here. Very, very happy, actually. Um, hey, one of the things you don't know is that quite often when I have meetings, I'll refer to somebody as Sir. So I was mm -hmm. just telling you the other day, uh, uh, Sir Al of Bombardier, and I hope he's listening because he loves his Bombardiers. Uh, but you actually are a knight. You, your formal right. title is Sir. Yes. Yeah, I was legally... Uh... Knighted by the royal family of uh, Spain. There's over 400 people uh, that were nominated globally through a nomination committee to the royal order. Yeah. And uh, I received a phone call over a year ago that uh, I was being nominated by two people who've actually been knighted already as a lady and a dame. Right. And uh, so my name was put forward and they wanted to go through the discovery and due diligence process. And so at first I thought, okay, how many people globally have been nominated? There's over right, 400 right, people. Right. I thought, okay, so what, what are the, statistically, what's the numbers? What's the odds of me being accepted with that? There's a lot more people across the planet in different positions of business and, and, and sports, entertainment, and academics that are much more qualified than me. Mm. So we started to go through the discovery and then the due diligence process, which is about four to six months in length. It's a very oh, it's long. process, right? There's a whole bunch of interviews, background checks, uh, reference checks, character checks, social media audits. There's a whole checklist of things that they go through to do their homework on you. And uh, as we started going through this discovery process and the due diligence, we started getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And I thought, okay, I'm getting shortlisted here just by uh, the, 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 the high level the intensity of the, the questions. questions. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so myself, uh, there's 24 of us that got selected for the world. Yeah. And I was one of the 24 people that were selected. And I became a Sir Darren Jacklin. And I was in the two categories. One is philanthropy. I do global oh. philanthropy around the world through Link Foundation, which is through our Link. international family foundation that's registered in Canada and the United States of America. Yeah. And uh, and then through business. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur since I was seven years old as a kid and, and involved actively and passively in multiple businesses internationally today. And uh, so, yeah. So never assume you're not being observed. Somebody's always <laughs> watching and observing you. Yeah. And you never know that, uh, you know, you're making a ripple of impact in people's lives and that, you um, you know, people are watching it. And sometimes you get on people's radar and uh, they without open even doors knowing for it. you. Without yeah. even knowing it. Yeah. Well, today I'd like to learn more about the philanthropy. A lot of people here do mission work or strong, sure. you know, a lot of faith driven mission work. And then there's also people just out of their own um, go giver mentality, you know, going out and doing things. So we want to touch on that. But one of the things that I have you on here to talk about today is how to attract and retain people. It's so interesting. You have a global perspective. I don't want to say like mine, but I tend to have a global perspective because I do the mm -hmm. podcast and I've worked in multiple countries and a lot of people listening have a local perspective. You know, they're in Chattanooga. That's where they do yeah. business, Absolutely. right? Or they're in Cincinnati, they're in Cleveland, all the cities that start with C, really. That's all mm -hmm. I've just listed there. Um, but, you know, you're going to bring a global perspective, which is interesting, I think. And the reason it's interesting is because many people think 
you don't understand the problems I've got here in Chattanooga, mm -hmm. in Cleveland, mm -hmm. in Cincinnati, or wherever it is, when in reality, we all face the same problems and there's similar strategies we can use, you know, to get sure. through those. Well, at the end of the day, we're in the people business and we're dealing with human beings and human beings have different personality styles, different skill sets, different mm. history and experiences. Yeah. But the key thing is, is that we're dealing with human beings. We're dealing with souls. We're dealing with other people. And the thing is, is that when we put people together and we put them into a team dynamic, sometimes they clash, sometimes they complement, and you got to work with different people and their personality styles and also their traumas. People have childhood traumas and they have things that have gone on to them in terms of trusting other people or respecting other people or following leadership or following rules and regulations or structure yeah. or order. And, uh, you know, and so that all plays into factors in terms of building teams. But the cool thing is that, you know, most of our goals and dreams don't require our actions. It's all about creating teams and teamwork. And I've built global organizations and things I'm uh, doing today. Yeah. And I'm a visionary, high level thinker, visionary, but I have people run the day to day operations. And so when people are attracting and retaining people, are you looking for a visionary, somebody who's a big picture person or somebody who's mm -hmm. an integrator to run the details of the day to day operations? And right. a lot of times people make the mistake when they're attracting good quality people think, oh my gosh, this person's got great ideas and this and that, but they're not the run who run the day to day operations. And they make the mistake. Yeah. You know, and I've, you know, listen, I've, I've been involved in an organization where we hired someone too quickly and it cost us over half a million dollars to get rid of that person because it was a wrong hire. Yeah, so you've you touched write on check, something, yeah, you've touched on something interesting there, which is when you make the wrong hire, get, yeah. you know, you have to realize very, very quickly, like what it, what's the saying? Hire slow and fire, fire fast, fast. And yeah. how many times have I fallen into that trap where I'm like, oh, just give, give him one more try. Give him one more try. For sure. And not, not that we're here today to talk about firing people, but I think attracting and retaining people should actually be called attracting and retaining the right people for our team. Because mm -hmm. somebody's not right for me doesn't mean they're a bad person. It doesn't mean they're not the right person. You're just not right on my team. Correct. Yeah. What do you think of that? Is that oh, my accurate sure, there? Yeah. You know, I have a master plan for my life, right? I, I I love to plan things. I love to structure things. I like to delegate things. And so I am always watching and observing talent, whether I'm going to a Starbucks, I'm on an mm. airplane, I'm in a restaurant, I'm out in some public uh, facility. I'm always watching and observing people and I watch how they interact and they don't realize that I'm watching and observing them and they could potentially be a candidate on my radar for an opportunity to have a conversation down the road. Hmm. Even when we've hired financial people, accountants, CPAs, all that stuff, you know, sometimes I'll watch you for a couple of years. And, and the key thing is, is that, you know, you just never know because behavior never lies and people hmm. can put on a good show and they can put oh. on a good resume and they can write that down. Your, educational background and their degrees, but behavior never lies. Right. And, you know, time will either promote you or time will expose you. It's just a matter of time, whether you get promoted or you get exposed. And this is what's happening when people are attracting and they want to retain good quality people is they hire too quickly. Oh my gosh, I just met this person at the gym and this person would be great for my organization but they don't do any due diligence. They don't do right. any reference checks. They don't do any scenario planning with this person and put them through, you know, some interview process or some scenarios of how they'd handle situations, how they'd lead other people or how they'd help, yeah. you know, buy or sell or invest in a product. And they don't scenario plan anything. And then they realize they get the wrong person in there. And now that person gets exposed versus promoted. And also it has a ripple of impact on your organization. Hmm. The other team members that are in your organization, when they start to see you putting certain people in, um, you know, I have um, a number of women, a number of ladies that work with me in our group of companies, mm -hmm. the Darren Jack group of companies. And I, a big mistake that I've learned over the years, that, and it's cost me financially a lot of money, uh, is not listening to women's intuition. So oh. I have now, when I interview people, I have a team of women that work with me. And we have a three-step process. Step number one is calm. Oh, I love it. Step Sorry. So step number calm. one is, what is it? Calm. 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 Yeah. Step number one is calm. Step number two is cautious, cautious, and step number three is nervous, nervous. So calm, cautious, or nervous. Same thing with money. When you're in investing, because I'm an yeah. investor, I invest in a lot of different businesses. I always ask my team when we're going through the discovery and due diligence process, are you calm, cautious, or nervous on writing the check that you to invest in this opportunity? You're one, hmm. two, or three. So we're interviewing someone or hiring someone. Are we calm, cautious, or nervous? If we're calm, it's like a traffic light. It's a green light on a traffic light. If it's, you're cautious, it's easy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yellow, it's amber. And if it's red, you're nervous, do not hire. So if you're calm, proceed. Right. Okay. If you're cautious, do more research, do more due diligence, do more fact checking. 
Take your time to unfold the situation. And if you're nervous, trust your gut, trust your intuition. Do not hire, do not write the check, do not get involved. Run the other way. So mm. calm, cautious, or nervous. And so a lot of times if I'm on Zoom video conferencing or I, I'm doing something remotely with my team, I'll send them a text message or a WhatsApp message. And I'll go one, two, or three. And oh, they'll okay. go behind the scenes and they'll give me one, two, or three, calm, cautious, or nervous. And they'll tell me, and I know right in real time, with that person that we're potentially interviewing or okay. writing a check to invest in something, whether we're calm, cautious, or nervous based on the collective intelligence and the consensus of the team. Right. And so uh, I love the fact that you've got a system for hiring, which Absolutely. I'm a big, uh, you'd expect. Yeah, I'm a systems business and coach. processes you need. I'm an entrepreneur like you. I, I believe in systems and I believe in brutally yes. simple systems. I don't like complicated, but I've got a two-step interview process that I use mm -hmm. and I'm not part of step one at all. I don't want to be part of step one. Is that, is that the kind of thing where you've got these other two people uh, involved? Are they, um, how do I say it? Are they public? Like, does the other person know, the person you're interviewing, does he know or she know that they're being interviewed? That that so, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Times, does they know yeah. there's three people in the room or do they think there's just you? Case by case situation. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. What I do is because I travel a lot internationally. I'm always traveling. Right. I'm always meeting people on airplanes, airport mm. lounges, conferences, seminars, workshops, uh, different events that I'm at. Sometimes I'm guest speaking at or on panels with as well. So I'll meet somebody. I think, hey, this person will be a potential candidate for one of our projects or one of our companies or something that we're working on within the group of companies or within the family foundation. And so what I'll do is I'll have a conversation, maybe a breakfast, lunch, or dinner with them, or just a, a conversation on an airplane with them. And I'll say, listen, I want to introduce you to some of my team members Hmm. And let's get together and have a conversation on Zoom video conferencing I or see. on Google Meets. And it's just a casual conversation. And what we're looking for is to see, do we have rapport with this person? Can we get to know, like, and trust this person? Uh, one, of, one of the tests that I always do is I think to myself, okay, Dom, if I was to hire you and I had to go away on an international business trip, would I trust you as a man-to-man -to, -man to take care of my family affairs mm -hmm. and my wife or my family if I had right. to go away on an international business trip? Am I calm, cautious, or nervous? One, two, or three. I love it. So such a simple, powerful system. And those are emotional responses. That has nothing to do with the technical skill of the person or their uh, what their professional background is. That's a that's a human assessment. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, when I'm having conversations with people, they don't even know that I'm interviewing. I could be in a restaurant talking to the server or waiter or waitress. <laughs> And I'm just like, oh, yeah, how long have you worked in this restaurant for? But I'm looking for attitude and people skills. I'm thinking, wow, this person has really good positive yeah. mental attitude and they have really good people skills. Mm -hmm. OK, things I look for, for example, is that when I'm acknowledging somebody in the restaurant industry and they say, well, you know, you're welcome. I'm looking for it's my pleasure to serve you. It's uh -huh. my pleasure to serve you. Um, you know, the Ritz Carlton Hotel is a great brand around the world, mm -hmm. has very high level standards of customer service when it comes to their guests that come into the Ritz-Carlton hotels, whether you're dining in a restaurant or mm -hmm. you're staying as a guest overnight. They have very high level of standards and they really focus highly on attraction and retention within the Ritz-Carlton brands because they're a recruiting pond for a lot of people that want to recruit. They think, oh my gosh, if I want a personal executive assistant or I want a house oh, manager, I, I want see. someone- They take them from there. Oh yeah, because they spend all the time and money and energy hiring and recruiting and retaining these people and then people come in and recruit from there. Yeah. So they have a great retention model. Res Carlton's to retain good quality staff. Yeah. When we talk about, uh, you bring up an interesting point there. When we talk about recruiting people, uh, one of the exercises I, I take my clients through when we're working together in coaching is to say, where is your perfect hire working right now? It might be a project manager. It could be an For administrator, sure. uh, um, foreman. Doesn't, doesn't matter what the position is. Where's that perfect person working now? I, it didn't occur to me because I don't think about that industry much that you'd want to go to one of the big brands like the Ritz Carlton. But maybe you want to go to one of the big home builders or big manufacturing facilities and talk to somebody that's currently working there because it's not all peaches and cream at those places. For it sure. might not be there. It might Absolutely. not suit their style. Maybe the hours are killing them. The requirements are killing them. And they'd love like to work somewhere closer for a yep. smaller company, et cetera. Well, you know, the thing is also what we look at too, when I'm in the exploratory discovery process with someone, you mm. know, a lot of times people think it's a financial decision, right? What's the return on investment? That person's coming to work with me because, you know, they got to get their paycheck. They got to get their financial dollars. What I focus on when I'm building the rapport so they get to know me and like me and trust me, some of the KPIs, key performance indicators and metrics is number one is ROL. What's the return on life? And then ROE, return on energy. 
Hmm. So ROL, return on life and return on energy. So as I'm building rapport with this person that I'm potentially interviewing or prospecting this person, what I'm looking for is when I'm sharing with them about our culture and our mission and vision of what yeah. we're doing within our organizations or, or Link Foundation, I'm talking about the return on life and also I'm talking about the return on energy because people want to be around an environment that's a positive environment. It's going someplace because there's a lot of workplaces out there that are very toxic environments. And when you're toxic, you come home at the end of the workday and you're completely exhausted and drained. You just want to lay on the couch and watch television. But I realize that you've got a family and you've got children that are coming home from school and they've got to, you know, you've got to make them dinner. You got to do homework. They need energy family too. Chores. Right? Yeah, your they family need needs energy. energy. You got to take the white. dogs for a walk, yeah. right? You're going to take your daughter to gymnastics or dance classes or your son to Boy Scouts or something like that. That is time and energy and effort that you need. So I want to make sure that at the end of your workday, you're coming home energized to greet your family when you walk through that door, mm. right? Versus coming home completely exhausted and drained. So creating a unique dynamic culture is very important. Now, people say, but Darren, how do I do that? Well, there's all kinds of trained development opportunities out there that you can get online. You can get mm. lots of free stuff on the YouTube. You can read books, you know, uh, take seminars or workshops. There's all kinds of trained development opportunities for you. But as a leader or an owner of an organization, you know, there's a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Dr. Stephen Covey wrote this book. Covey, that's right. Habit number yeah. seven is sharpening the saw or Love sharpening it. the ax. Yeah. You as a leader of an organization got to constantly keep sharpening the saw or sharpening the ax in terms of your training development skills. You got to constantly keep leveling up and scaling up. If you're not, then you're not going to get high performance people. You know, in our group, we, we build high performance teams. Like we mm -hmm. have a very efficient, very effective, high performance teams that are extremely results driven, that are specific, measurable, actual results. And people say, oh my gosh, like how do you build high performance teams? We attract high performance people. And then now, we train them and support absolutely. them. Yeah. You know, one of the things I look for is integrity because without integrity, nothing works, right? So I look at when it comes to integrity is do people keep their word? Because mm -hmm. our word creates our world. So- Dom, when I say I'm going to be someplace, I give you my word. I'm going to be there early because to me, early is on time and on time is late. I've got a, I use an You're iPhone. You're just like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I will. I have it in my calendar. I have a calendar reminder that's emailed and text messages to me. It also pops up my laptop or desktop computer. But I also set alarms on my mobile phone. So I have transition planning time from each meeting. So I'm always on time hmm. because we can meet 20 times, Dom. And one time I'm late, I'm forgiven. Because I have a consistent track record with you of always being on time and always being in place. Yeah. And that's the key thing with stuff like that, right? So yeah. the key thing is when it comes to when it comes to um, our integrity, it's so important because behavior never lies, as I said earlier. So what, what I look at is I look at, do people keep their word? Now, we hear a lot in business that talk is cheap. I think step number two is most people cheap in their talk because their words have no power. Mm. Because they say things that they don't fall through. So one of the things I also look at when I'm hiring people or interviewing people is does this person do complete work? Are they someone who starts something and yeah. then they chase a shiny object and they're off to something else and they got all these shiny Squirrel. objects? They got squirrels. Squirrel, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or are they someone who does complete work? How do you I, test for that? You know, when you're doing an interview process for some position, yeah. um, do you have social tests? I do, that. yeah, and I also want to know how. I also want to know, you know, what kind of books do they read? Do they watch TV or watch movies, documentaries? Uh, do they do any hobbies, any community events? Do they go to any trade shows, conferences, seminars, workshops? Do they take family vacations. Do they right. attend church? Um, do they do things with their children? What are their kids involved with? Are their spouses? So I like partner? that. So you're you're asking more than the technical skill. Like, do you know how to roof a house? Do you know how to install a furnace? Do you know how to level cabinets? You're actually saying, tell me about your life. Tell me what you're doing. I, I actually want to hear that they're really involved in their kids' baseball and that they're the coach or the manager of the Absolutely. team or yeah. that they're involved in judo or jujitsu or that they're in their choir. Yeah. Because I, I, just like you, I need them to have a life outside of this For sure. that means they see something more. I don't yeah. want to hire a gamer who says, I'm just waiting for GTA 9 to come out so I could take an entire week off work for the new release. Like that's... I don't yeah. want that person on my team. Absolutely. I'm also looking for authenticity and also vulnerability. I'm mm -hmm. also looking for full transparency in terms of how, how deep can I go with this person during the initial interview or discovery process with this person is how vulnerable can this person be? Mm -hmm. As human beings, we screw up. We make mistakes. 
right? We're going to do things that we have blind spots. We don't always do things right, right? We have strengths and weaknesses. We also have blind spots. And I want to see, is this person going to put their cards on the table and say, look, you know, I, I'm not good at this. This is my weakness. Mm. And, I, and, and I admit I'm not good at this. So I want to look at how vulnerable and authentic can this person be to really tell me? Because they put on the game face when you meet them. And they're like, oh, I'm great at this and this and that. And then after a while, you you bring them on, you onboard and you realize, oh my gosh, time will either promote you or time will expose you. Yeah. Now they're being exposed because of all these weaknesses. And now yeah. does that create risk and liability for me as a decision maker, as an owner oh, of a business? Does it Am ever. I exposed there now? Yeah, does it ever? I, I have a, a, a saying that's is slightly inappropriate, but I'm going to say it. I think I'm sure. hiring Eva Longoria, but Rosie O'Donnell shows up for work. Absolutely. And I've just, I have been fooled by a good interview because there's people out there who know how to do a great interview, say whatever it takes, present themselves in one way. But then as soon as they show up, almost on the first day, you can start to see them picking away and just not trying to be a team member, trying to reset the company to their their vision instead of understanding they're now part of a, a different team. For and, sure. uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a very active hiker. I hike all over the world. Yeah, you mentioned I, that in our pre-interview. That's right. One of my passions. Tell, tell, just really quickly, tell me about some of the cool places you've hiked because some other listeners may have sure. done that as well. So I've hiked uh, in Colorado, some of the 14er mountains. Mm. I've hiked throughout British Columbia, Canada. I'm off to Kilimanjaro here in Tanzania, East Africa, which is one wow. of the top mountains in the world. I'll be hiking that uh, later this year, just a few yeah. months from now. Uh, I'm exploring, uh, looking at uh, Mount Everest base camp for next year, Patagoy. I'm looking at going to as well. Okay. Um, and I'm hi hiking the Swiss Alps actually later this year. Tatiana and I are going to be going to Swiss Alps and hiking up there. I also use it as an interview place because uh, Chip Wilson, the founder of Lululemon, built right. a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, Chip, uh, Chip Wilson, who I've met a number of times, Chip always said when he's hiring people, he likes to take them hiking. Because mm -hmm. you can take somebody to a restaurant or do a, a Zoom video call with somebody or meet somebody. But if you're hiring someone or investing in somebody as an investor, when you go hiking, you can't hide anything. <laughs> no, you can't. Gasping. You got to be totally vulnerable. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. And everything shows up on a hiking trail. So sometimes people take people golfing. Golfing is great, but you can hide a lot of things in golf. People look at, you know, is a person going to cheat on their golf game and golf score? But when you're hiking, you're totally exposed. Mm. Right. Because the thing is, if you're out hiking in the wilderness on a designated hiking trail, I always, you know, people always ask me, they go, oh my gosh, is there wild animals out here? I said, sure. And, and then you can see people's fear. You can see their insecurities. Uh, okay. And I always share with people, I said, listen, yeah, there's wild animals out here. We might see a cougar or a lynx or a bobcat or a black bear or a grizzly bear today. There's a possibility. Yeah. We might see that. You know, we're guests here in their environment. So I always say to people, the fear is real. So honor and celebrate those body sensations you feel in your human body, mm. but there's no threat. So the fear is real, but the threat is not. So what I'm what I'm looking for in the discovery process of the due diligence is when I'm out hiking with this person mm -hmm. and I'm looking to hire them or financially invest in them, I'm looking to say, okay, how does this person deal with adversity? How do they deal with setbacks, failures? Sometimes I'll purposely mm -hmm. go off the hiking trail and I'll actually intentionally get lost for a period of time. See how, they, see how they deal with disorganization, chaos. How they deal with, oh my gosh, we're not following the business plan. We're not following the path forward here. How do you deal with things? Do you ask for help? Do you withdraw and avoid? Do you get aggressive? Do you start mm -hmm. yelling and swearing? Do you act out? Because of, you know, now, now I'm not talking to the 54-year-old man, Dom. I'm talking to the seven-year-old Dom. <laughs> so I'm looking for all the behavioral right. signs of how do you deal with unpleasant, uncomfortable situations? Let me, Sometimes, let me, let me take that yeah. off of, cause not everybody can hike. We've got people Correct. listening here who are in the middle of Nebraska or up, yes, in, up, up North in Canada. They might be, you know, just outside of Winnipeg. There's not a lot of hiking to be had, but we can, we can recreate that kind of situation, especially for our top level hires where it's important. And one of the tools that I've used on occasion, I don't, I don't hire executive level all the time, but is to take the person, let's say that I was going to interview you for a CFO position, as an mm -hmm. example. It's an important position. For sure. Very critical, right? So I would invite you and your spouse and me and my spouse out for dinner. Mm -hmm. And then I would look to see, one of the things that I look for is how you react to the serving staff, which is just yes. what you were talking about earlier. Because yes, I sure. want to see if they're rude, if they're impolite, if, the, if they said, you know, no potatoes and potatoes showed up. I want to see how they react to that. And although it's a smaller example of what you've talked about there, we can do those things. We could set up those social experiments and it really tells us a lot about the people we're interviewing more than, more than any box that got ticked more than anything else sure. to see how they act and react. 
Well, you know, you mentioned earlier too that some people some people can't go hiking. So I I was just in Detroit just a couple of days ago in Detroit, Michigan. Well, it's pretty it's a, you know it's pretty flat there. Not right? very so I went for a walk <clears throat> with a gentleman, and as we're walking on this walking trail, there's mm-hmm. a bunch of garbage on the trail. So I always pick it up. I mm-hmm. I was a Boy Scout, leave no trace. Always leave it better than you found it. And I watched this guy, and the one guy I was with, he just kicked it to the side underneath a um, underneath a park bench, and I thought interesting. Right. Mm. Just just out of sight, out of mind. Whereas I pick up things. So you can learn a lot by people's behavior is do they pick up things like I, and that's something I always do when I go on hiking or going walking. How do people take care of their environment? How do they are they situational aware? Do they say good morning? Do they say please? Do they say thank you. Are they are they saying hello to people? Are they making eye contact? All these things I'm looking for, especially it depends on different positions that you're hiring yeah, for people. Yeah. But if you're hiring forward facing people that are the face and brand of your company, your organization, they're on the phone and customer service or they're their first point of entry when you walk into a retail bricks and mortar store and they see you, how are they forward facing to the consumer in regards to building your brand awareness yeah. and the integrity of your brand? Yeah, well, they do represent your brand. One of the things that we often forget is that as soon as I put somebody in my branded truck, they own my brand. For sure. I'll give you an example on this. So I have a good friend of mine. He's retired now. So years ago, he owned a big trucking company and uh, he was hauling water and milk for dairy farmers. And uh, so what he would do is he'd run ads in the newspapers looking for drivers, truck Mm. drivers. And what they would do is they would show up and, and this is in Canada. They would show up and meet with him at his office. And he was in an industrial park of an office. And in a short distance away, there was a Tim Hortons donuts. It's like a Dunkin' Donuts, like a Starbucks. People lived in the States or other countries. And he would say, listen, you know, um, it's really busy around here. It's going to be a little bit noisy. Listen, he said, why don't we just leave the office here and go to the local Tim Hortons here and have a conversation? Now, he's hiring for a truck driver position. Right. So what he's doing when he leaves the office, you're going to be driving your – so I'll say, Dom, listen, you know what? Uh, My keys are in the office right now. Do you mind if we just jump into your automobile and go to Tim Hortons? Sure. Because I'm hiring you for a truck driving position. And when we get in, he's wanting to see how clean your vehicle is. How do you drive your vehicle? Okay. Do you shoulder check? Do you use right and left and and, and review mirror? And that's the uh, real interview, isn't it? Do you do a complete stop at the stop sign or do you roll through the stop sign? When yeah. you pull up to Tim Hortons, where do you park? How do you park? How do you park? <laughs> the how, right. And he said, Darren, by the time I got to the Tim Hortons donuts, the interview is either going to go forward or it was going to complete right there. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And it, that's the social side of doing these things. You know, the not to keep coming back to the two-step process that I have, but one of the things we ask is, or in, in, the, in the first step, the job of my admin person or a trusted other person than me, right? Because if you mm-hmm. don't have an administrator, somebody else has to do this. Let's just say that you've applied to work for me. I'm going to call you unannounced and say, hey, we just got your application. Just yes. want to confirm a few details before we get you together with an appointment for Dom. Can you talk right now? And they'll say, yeah, I got all the time in the world. Well, the follow-up question is, aren't you at work? Ah, don't worry about it. Yeah. Well, that interview is over. That interview is already done because I want somebody to say, actually, I'm sorry, I can't talk right now. Can we talk at my lunch break, at my coffee break? And there's a couple of those social experiments that are built in there. And I don't mind saying this one. People can attack me for this all they want, and I will wear it as a badge of honor. Yeah. When the person is on that first phone call, the first level phone call, they will also say, I know I caught you off guard and I appreciate your time. Do you need to grab a smoke or are you okay to talk right now? And when they give that answer, you guys already know where I'm going with this. When they say, no, 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 I'm fine. I just had a smoke. That gets noted. Mm-hmm. And I, I have my own personal pet peeve that smokers take 15 minute breaks when nobody else is allowed to. And yeah. so that gets noted. The interview either goes ahead or stops or, you know, that person moves ahead or stops based on those observations, but everything is up for uh, up for discussion. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I recently interviewed a gentleman and I said to him, I said, what's one of the craziest things you've ever done in your life? He goes, well, I hit a police officer one time in the face. I punched out a police officer one time. And I said, well, what happened? And he goes, oh man, I was at this, this party and this concert. And this guy, this guy got me upset. My, my, my anger management kicked in. I got angry and I got triggered. And, and this police officer came to stop me and, and I clocked the guy. And I said, oh, yeah, did you go to jail for that? Or something? He goes, yeah, I, I got three months in jail for that and a criminal record. And he goes, and I said, oh, yeah. I said, so is that the only thing you've ever got a criminal record for? He goes, no, I have multiple criminal charges. And but so the thing is, I asked, what's the craziest thing you've ever done in your life? Right? Because And I'm looking for wherever avenue you want to go. So right. the craziest thing I've ever done is I went on a water slide. I jumped over the airplane and went skydiving. Yeah, I made right? a turducken. You're like, okay, yeah. well, that's I crazy to you. Wa- yeah. 
or scuba diving, I fed a shark out of my hand underwater. It could be a crazy yeah. thing for you. Everybody's going to interpret crazy thing differently. Wow. But I'm looking to see where you're going to go with that. And this guy says, yeah, I punched out a police officer. Now, if you were trying to hire a security guard, maybe that's a different uh, take on things. But of course, that interview went the way it needed to go based on the answer, yeah. right? Yeah. One of the things I do when I'm out in public, when I'm, I'm traveling around, is I have uh, people can write this down as a script. So let's say, for example, Dom, I meet you in a restaurant or an airplane. Mm. And uh, I see you in action, you know, uh, working on the airplane or or I see you in a restaurant. I'll say, hey, Dom, hi, my name is Darren Jacqueline. Listen, you know, I've never really met you before. We don't know each other. But I'm just curious. Are you open to some other career opportunities or job opportunities out there if they were available? Ah. And listen, I know right now, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. But if you're open to it, I'd love to uh, exchange contact information or contact emails. Because sometimes if you're talking to a woman or female, mm -hmm. she may not want to give you her mobile number, her yeah. cell number. So sure. she may feel more comfortable giving you her primary email or secondary email address, right? She's got mm -hmm. a home or a work email address. And so I will exchange contact information. I said, listen, then I'll open up my mobile phone and I'll set up a date and time right there with the person. So it's in their phone or my phone, or I'll send them a calendar invitation by email. Mm. But if I can get them to link up cell phone to cell phone right there with calendars, if they have a calendar, I'll do it right then. Then I call you and I have a conversation with you either on video or by telephone. Sure. And let's say, for example, I call you and you're not open to the opportunity. You know, you had 24, 48 hours of cooling up and you think, you know what? I'm happy with where I'm at right now. I'm not open to any other opportunities right now. I'm a no. I'll say, you know, Dom, it's been great to, to have a conversation. Dom, would you mind if I ask you a personal question? Who do you know right now that's in your network of people that is just like you? Mm. We're looking to hire people just like you with the attitude and people skills that you presented to me that are just like you. And so that's what we're looking for is looking that's for That's a nice that. compliment. Yeah. And so you might know somebody who's a, an A player that's in your network that's open to an opportunity right now, whereas yeah. you may not be open to an opportunity. That's great. You know, you just reminded me of a story from way, way back when I was a kid. My One of my older cousins worked at a Dairy Queen. Mm -hmm. And then she said, you know, she had to quit. She had to go back to school. And the manager said, oh my God, we just love having you here so much. I wish there were two of you. And so my cousin said, well, actually my sister's looking for a job. Yeah. And would you believe her younger sister, my other cousin, ended up one day becoming a manager of that Dairy Queen. Wow. So you just don't know. It's I, I don't know. I've forgotten that story a thousand times and thank you for reminding me of it, but you don't know. But when you find somebody that uh, acts and looks a certain way, they hang out with other people they who do. do that as well. Yeah. Um, I'm worried that we're taking a lot of your time and I still want to get to link. You've got the coolest sure. background there for people who aren't seeing this as a video. Of course it's on YouTube and Darren has in the back it's, it's pronounced link, right? L Y two N K. Yeah. Yeah, Link Foundation. It's uh, LY2NK stands for Leaders Yielding to New Knowledge, but it goes by Link Foundation. It's an internationally recognized charity in Canada and the United States. Yeah, and and it looks like a school. To, sorry, <clears throat> Darren, can you please tell me what Link is? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, you know what? Right. So our success is someone else's miracle. Just think about that for a moment. Our success is someone else's miracle. And in our lives, we have first world problems, but there's mm -hmm. many people around the planet who have third world problems mm -hmm. and their basic necessities of survival, whether it's clean drinking water, having a safe place to sleep at night, um, you know, having to find their next meal uh, is much different than us living in the first world. Yeah. And so I, uh, in my twenties, I'm in my fifties now, but in my twenties, when I met some of my mentors and they advised me and also challenged you that when you do better in life, always remember to pay it forward and pass it on. And be of service to humanity. So Ted, Ted and I over the last couple of years have put together an international foundation called Link Foundation for Global Philanthropy Projects. We've committed $100 million over the next decade wow. to global philanthropy projects. And um, what we started doing now is we've started building schools over in Africa. Mm. Now, one of the most lucrative businesses in the world today is human and child sex trafficking and also what we call organ harvesting. So they look at oh. children in remote areas around the world that are really going nowhere in their yeah. perception, their mind. So why don't we go ahead and steal these children, cut oh, them my. open, take their vital organs and sell them on the dark web and get anywhere from 50 to a hundred thousand dollars for vital organs in other countries around the world oh, that people goodness. are on, on, or, uh, on donors lists. So they human just, trafficking is not about sex trafficking. It's actually about organ trafficking as well. Yeah. So you can, you can human and child sex traffic, which is big business. But if you want to go a step further, you can then, uh, oh collateralize and monetize the vital organs of a human being. Oh my God. And people can do the research on this. Don't trust me. Do there's, there's lots of research and information. And one of the biggest, um, 
one of the, this is going to shock a lot of people, but one of the biggest human trafficking events of the year is the Super Bowl. And people just right. go into Google and type in human traffic and Super Bowl, and you can see all the news media reports that come up on it. It's it's very well publicized. It's it's uh is the Super Bowl every year oh, wow. in the United States of America. The Super Bowl is one of the biggest places for human trafficking and child oh, sex trafficking. I did not, yeah. And it's, uh, the depravity yeah, kind of it shocks me. I, I suppose yeah. part of this is I choose not to pay attention, and so I don't yeah. pay attention, right? And that's so we're funny. yeah, so we're forced for good. And 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 I've traveled, I've done a number of humanitarian <clears throat> trips around the world over the over the last several years. And I've met with some of the most impoverished people on the planet. I've met with these young mothers mm. and young fathers, and I asked them, if we I was a genie and I could grant you a wish, what would you want as a wish to receive? And they said, We want to fight the enemy with education. Give a child a book and a, and a book will, 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 because when you build self-confidence and self-esteem in a young child, that child has, 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 has boundaries. They're, they're right. much more aware and awake yeah. and the, the traffickers and the predators will not go after those people, right? Wow. Because they're a lot more self-confident. And so with Link Foundation, we've actually built our first school or in, over in Liberia, West Africa. Liberia, West Africa, it's one of the poorest countries on yeah, the planet. Yeah, it's a tough place. That's right. It's yeah. extreme hardship and financial insecurities over there and uh, a lot of challenges. And so we have our first school from preschool to grade six over there. And just for people to understand, 50,000 US dollars can build you a school over in Africa. Oh, it's not a, a yeah, that's, no. that's doable. So we're going to be building many schools through Link Foundation. And then what we started was another program called E2E, which is Elevate to Educate. Hmm. which is our hiking fundraising arm for Link Foundation. So I actually take people across North America. People can always go to hikingfundraiser.com, hikingfundraiser.com. And we do hikes all over North America and the United States of America and Canada, where I take people out for a day or a few hours and we go hiking. We right. raise financial dollars through their um, their membership donations. that they pay to come okay. out, donations. Yeah. And from sponsorship. And then that money goes to build the school through Link Foundation. We also issue them a tax receipt if they want a tax receipt. And then on our social media channels through Link Foundation and through E2E, they can see it all unfold, the construction and the development and the planning process of what we're doing with building these schools. Well, this and audience loves want, construction. So that, that lines yeah. up really and well. And we're always looking for people to volunteer to come out and help us you know, do any humanitarian project to come out and be of service. It's kind of like Habitat for Humanity. You right. can come with us. We do it one to two times a year. We take groups of people, small to, groups. Over people. to Liberia. We take it to Liberia right now. And uh, yeah, and we go there and we, we're we boots on the ground and we're building stuff. And it's uh, it's an incredible community service project where you really feel so much joy and fulfillment and pleasure of doing this. And it's let, a lot Can of I ask you something? Let, let, you're going to, let's take a checkerboard in, in our minds, sure. right? So black squares, red squares, just a bunch of squares. Right now, if that was a piece of real estate, there's no school on there at all. Correct. But there's people living land. there. It's just raw land. So how are the, the the children there being educated now? There's no education. And so, so when you, you plunk a school on a middle red square, yes. now the, they have a place to go. But otherwise, the whole there village is no... comes together. Otherwise, the child will grow up illiterate and, and never take a day of school in their life. Really? They'll never, they'll, they'll never, they'll never go to school. They'll be illiterate and uh, uneducated through their entire life. We we have little girls that we've we've helped rescue now in our Link Leadership Academy, our school. Mm -hmm. When we go on these trips, you know, we we do scenario planning, we do orientation stuff on Zoom a few months before we go, so we can mm -hmm. preset people in terms of what to expect in terms of you know scenario planning, you know, best case scenario, like case scenario, worst case scenario, so they have it in their mindset to prepare for this because right. it can be traumatic for some people. Well, like right? you said, threat versus what was your analogy threat when you take somebody for a hike. The threat of a grizzly bear versus the reality. You yeah, got to exactly, be prepared yeah. for the threat versus the reality. Yeah, totally. And so the thing <laughs> is, is that what we show people is that you'll see 11 or 12 year old young little girl having their first child as soon as they reach puberty. Oh. And sometimes you'll see a young girl, 16, 17 years of age. She's already had three with three different fathers in the village. Mm. And sometimes by that woman, 16, 17 years of age, she'll bury her first child. Her first child will actually die. Oh. And so she deals with that traumatic event as being a young teenage mother of dealing with the death of a young child. It's 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 what you see in the third world is completely different than the first world. We sometimes we can't comprehend it. It's unimaginable. And but when you see that something so little can have a ripple of impact in terms of making a difference and serving humanity, it's so rewarding that you know that you can build a school or you can bring in clean drinking water or you can provide 
you know, somebody times we have people who are, who are, who are authors and they've written a best selling book and they're like, Hey, I want to, I want to really serve humanity with my best selling book. Great. Let's box up, box up a couple of your boxes of your books and let's put them in the school library and right. now educate the children on this to give the next generation a chance and an opportunity. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. I've seen, you know, what I love to do around the world is hunt and fish. And I've seen people that have gone to other countries and they bring school supplies to these villages or Absolutely. glasses, eyeglasses. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, I haven't had a chance to go do that international stuff in some of these countries, but I always think, okay, I have to make sure that I bring a luggage that's just full of that stuff. But I've, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever gone beyond that more to think that the school that I'm dropping it off at, or, you know, the charity that I'm, that I'm trying to assist, if it didn't exist, that would be a complete vacuum. It's not that there's a choice. It, what I'm understanding is not that they'll just go to a different school. Or there's no other school. A, there is none. There is no, no school. Yeah, no. And the thing is, then we bring in a playground. So we have a joint venture partner who comes in and builds <laughs> the playground attached to the school. And now you create play in a community. Yeah. And now a play opens up so many doors of possibilities from teamwork to communication skills, to having fun, to having joy, to creating life experiences and memories. And so this school is a central piece of the village master plan. Mm. And then we can look at economic development of actually creating for-profit businesses as part of a master plan. And then we create employment opportunities for the parents, the people living in that village. Sure. And yeah. then the cash flow, some of that, that profit will then go back to the school to pay for the school teachers and the oper op operational and overhead costs of running that school in terms of our expenses. Yeah. Such, so a, such a big worldview. This is why you're called Sir Darren, Jacqueline. Yeah, I'm grateful. Yeah. Thank, well, I, I guess I, I don't think we realize that, you know, philanthropy really operates, a, it, it, you know, we're, the reason that we do philanthropy is not to feel good about ourselves, to help others. And yeah. I, it's so interesting to hear you talk the about The secret that. to living is giving. And our success is someone else's miracle. And yeah. when you realize that when you're, you know, you're doing what you're doing, that can be a blessing and be of service to somebody else in, in humanity. And you're dealing with people who could never, ever repay you. You know, the average person lives on less than $2 and 50 cents a day. in some of these You know, world countries. do you know the question that's been going through my mind is how much does a teacher make? And it's just because I'm a business coach. $30 a that, month. There you go. A dollar a day, a dollar a day. So that's why it's so affordable, but then the impact far outweighs the economic invest. Uh, do Correct. you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're investing 50 grand, but the economic impact is so much bigger. Well, because it, it goes for generations. Absolutely. And yeah. here's something to consider. People say to me all the time, Darren, why don't you pay them 50 or or $100 a month? Come on, Darren. It's, they're in the third world. Here's the thing. Then you create risks. So here's the risk. When you, when you give somebody a lot Target. more money that's living in a third world country in a really impoverished area, when you pay them more money, they now become a target for break and enter or home invasion or for kidnapping or extortion. Mm. Right. Okay. Because all of a sudden you're making more money, and somebody who's not doing well says, "Well, hell, if I steal from you, I'll have you're more. You've got plenty to get paid next month." Right. You're doing a lot better than I. It's the haves and haves nots. And so what happened was, and this happened to me years ago in the Philippines. I was hiring staff in the Philippines. I still have staff today that work with me in the Philippines, and um, in India, we would want to buy them a washer, or a dryer, or a dishwasher, or a microwave oven. And then all of a sudden, two months later, we're on a call and, and they got broken into and now they got their dishwasher stolen or the microwave oven stolen because they've got something that somebody else doesn't. So they stole the microwave and now they sold it to somebody else in another part of the community or city and they got money for it. And I'll give wow. you an example. We built um, a few years ago as one of our humanitarian projects, we bought some land in Uganda, East Africa. <clears throat> and we built a chain link fence around the land because we uh -oh. didn't want any squatters on the land. Right. We actually had some people come in in the middle of the night and actually stole the chain link fence. Take, take the, fence. the fence. Yeah, because it had value. It had value. They could sell uh, the fence. Oh, wow. <clears throat> we live inside a marshmallow, and I don't think we appreciate, yeah. you know, the, the I'm glad you brought us the perspective. Uh, if somebody wants to find you in this big, wide world or reach you or ask you questions or have curiosities, how do we find you? You know, great easy way is hikingfundraiser.com. That's connected to Link Foundation, hikingfundraiser.com. Uh, they can also go to darrenjacklin.com or just mm -hmm. Google me. But uh, yeah, and if people like to come out and go for walks or go for hikes or get out there in terms of health, come on out with me sometime and join what we're doing with E2E and Link Foundation. And uh, we'll have a conversation. Maybe you can be involved with E2E or Link Foundation or within the Darren Jack Group companies. I'm involved in a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I've got people, you know, I'm more the visionary, more high level, but I've got people running the day-to-day operations, everything. But um, I love meeting people. I love making yeah. a difference. In yeah. You're lives. very personable and very, very uh, giving of your time and uh, expertise and your, and, and your vision, your giving of your visionary, you know, and, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you for being a guest on the show. I really appreciate it. I look forward to when this goes live and hearing back from everybody about what they picked up from here today. All right. I'm thank you, to be here. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, 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 Sir Darren Jacqueline, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your energy and enthusiasm has to be global. It just can't be held inside a local market. Um, but boy, did we cover off a lot of ground. And, and really, really well. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm glad to have you here helping to educate and inspire my audience. That's what I live for. I live to, to help others and, and guide and maybe a- answer the questions that people didn't even know they had before the episode started. We got into quite a bit of depth here on social experiments, how to set things up with people while we're doing the interview to make sure that they're the right person for our team and to expose the cracks. Actually, you had a great saying. Let me see here. Time will promote you or time will expose you. Time will promote you or time will expose you. And you said that also based on behavior never lies. And then we started talking about how to find indications that somebody has the right kind of behaviors that lines up with my values, who I am, uh, my vision, where I'm going, and all of those things. And so that was very interesting. So those of you listening who might be thinking, this is way over my pay grade. I, you know, I run a renovation company. We've got three guys. Why would I care about recruiting when I've got a crew of three? Because that's exactly when you need to start worrying about recruiting. Adding the wrong person to your team now is disastrous. And then the rest of you are listening going, well, I've got 20 people on the crew. I'm kind of okay. We're set. We're we're stable where we are. As a matter of fact, one of my top guys is going to retire in two or three years, but we're good. To which I would reply, your top guy is going to retire in two or three years. You've got a stable, but maybe stagnant job force. How are you replacing those people? How are you top grading? Where where is your new apprentices coming in? And if you're going to hire those people, where are you finding them? Because maybe your ax isn't sharp. Again, something Darren and I talked about in the show. So maybe you haven't been recruiting in a long time and you've got to wear that hat again. These things are always going to be in the forefront. And as leaders, we get challenged. We get challenged because unless you come to a show like this, where do you find leadership training? Where do you find entrepreneurship training? Unless you're listening to people like Sir Darren Jacklin or myself, who are entrepreneurs, who have built and sold multiple businesses, who run multiple operations, and who aren't reading out of a book and saying, well, I wrote this in a book six years ago, so that's all I talk about, and it must be true. No, this is real world experience here. So you have to tie into that to get yourself the shortcuts, to find the simple, simple systems. You know, I realized I just knocked people who wrote books, and some of you have bought my book, (laughs) Construction Millionaire Secrets. All those other books are irrelevant. Mine's the only one that's relevant, which is exactly what you'd expect an author to say, right? My point here is, is that if you want to find ways of doing things more effectively and more efficiently, talk to people who are actually doing that now. Stay away from theory, go towards reality. Um, Darren, thank you so much for joining us here. I like your system. There's this internal system. Again, we talk about simple systems on the show all the time, folks. The simple system that I wrote down from Sir Darren is this, when I'm interviewing somebody, am I calm, am I cautious, or am I nervous? Actually do it right now as you listen to me. Do I make you calm, do I make you cautious, or do I make you nervous? Now I know I'm a pretty high energy person, so maybe calm isn't the word you would use to describe me, but are you comfortable around me, are you cautious around me, or are you nervous? And I'll make this very bold statement right now, If you find yourself cautious around me, if you find yourself nervous around me, then you need to unsubscribe from this podcast ASAP because you're just not going to be getting what you need. You need to go find somebody else that provides the kind of vision and implementation and the how to of doing this because you're not going to get what you need from me. And now this would be a waste of your time. So I'm saying this because I believe I'm the best business coach in the world. And as the best business coach in the world, I have to face the grim reality with you at any given moment in time. So using our system, listening to my show, does my show make you calm? Does it make you cautious or does it make you nervous? And if you find that you can't trust me or you're nervous around me, then you have to unsubscribe. And I I wish you all the best. Anyways, there you go. Live by the sword, die by the sword. But folks, 
this is reality. This is your business. Your family's relying on you to make the right moves. And I'm here to assist where I can. Uh, thanks for listening in. Thank you, Sir Darren Jacqueline.